this all credibility post the truth is much less believable than the fiction we're selling. By October 1954, we had mastered what's called gravity control, which most engineers at MIT and elsewhere do not think we can do today. But that was in a deeply classified project. Now, how do I know that? Because one of the people on my team, Richard Foch, who was the top scientist at the largest Department of Defense lab, the Naval Research Labs, but was on my team for many, many years, he uh, was in the vault and saw the papers that that proved as stated. Supercharged. 1954 is when we mastered gravity control. Ironically, that in 1955, Eisenhower started the U.S. Uh, interstate highway system. And by that date, we didn't need highways. Isn't it astonishing to think that as far back as 1954, humanity had already unlocked secrets of gravity that modern science still struggles to acknowledge? Dr. Greer introduces us to a revelation that challenges our understanding of physics and engineering. But why, after mastering such groundbreaking technology, did we continue to build highways instead of skyways? What does this tell us about the secrets held by our governments? How might our world have evolved if gravity control technology had been made public instead of being concealed? Look, the reason it's being kept so secret is because the technologies behind how those objects move. They have no jets. They have no rockets. They're not an internal combustion engine. And they most certainly don't have a nuclear power plant on them because there's no heat signature and nuclear power fission is hot. When you look at them, you realize it's a whole new physics, a whole electromagnetic propulsion type system using very high voltage systems, similar to what Nikola Tesla and other people stumbled across in the early 20th century. But I said, if that were to be disclosed, we would terminate oil, gas, coal, nuclear power, wind, solar, you name it, and public utilities. You're talking a huge transformation in how the world operates. Now, on the one hand, it would be disruptive to the status quo of the macroeconomic system. On the other hand, it would end all pollution. It would end all poverty in 20 years, and everyone on the planet would have quote-unquote free energy from what's called the zero-point energy field. But we can discuss this later. So he said, ah, I get it. So, you know, it's about power, money, and the corrupting influence of it. It is not about science, because once you drill down the science, the evidence is absolutely overwhelming. Dr. Greer unveils a world where energy is limitless and the chains of pollution and poverty are broken. The implications of disclosing such advanced technologies could have revolutionized our society, yet the thirst for power and control keeps these innovations hidden. Imagine a world powered by clean, free energy. Why do you think those in power fear this change? What would our planet look like today if zero-point energy had replaced traditional power sources decades ago? When I first started working with all these guys here, they have a type of, I call it disclosure PTSD, that is traumatic. For me, in the 1990s, it was very traumatic to find out about this was absolutely real, that it was being kept secret, that it was out of control, and that there was a compartmented part of it that were already committing atrocities such as staged fake alien abductions and mutilations. Everybody's heard of these. Everybody assumes they're alien. They are not. We have a testimony from Air Force Intelligence officer as well as documents that prove that those were being done by humans for their, quote, psychological warfare value. So I think there are two things. One is that they want to keep the energy technologies away, and this is why we did the lost century and how to reclaim it with an expose of what the world has lost through this illegal secrecy and how we need to regain it and what the world looks like after that, which is gorgeous, beautiful, a totally transformed planet if we no longer had to have any polluting sources of energy. The energy itself was free once you had the device, a zero-point generator system, and poverty around the world would vanish in a generation, about 20 years. But there's some big stakeholders, right? Hundreds of trillions of dollars at stake. Um, so this is where you get into a real power struggle, which is what this issue is. The other part of it is that it, it, if you look at sort of the lockdowns and global control that happened, and I'd be blunt, I know for a fact that was a beta test for what they're wanting to do on this issue, and that is to disclose it in such a way 
that it manipulates the public into fear so that they can then, through sort of a totalitarian militarism and central state authority, control the whole world, not just one country. As Reagan said, wouldn't our job of creating world unity be easier if we had a common alien threat to fight? So this is why they've spent so much time making, you know, bad Hollywood movies and UFO conferences and staging these ridiculous abductions, which are gruesome, and there are terrible victims of those, but they're not being done by extraterrestrial beings, they're being done by what's called stagecraft, using advanced man-made ET-looking craft, but they're not ET. The concept of disclosure PTSD sheds light on the psychological toll that harboring such monumental secrets can take on individuals. Dr. Greer's narrative reveals a sinister side to secrecy, where staged events manipulate public perception for psychological warfare. How deep does this rabbit hole go, and what are the real motivations behind keeping such transformative technologies under wraps? Could the staging of alien abductions be a smokescreen for something even more significant the governments are hiding? One of my jobs is to warn the public and these officials of this sort of subterfuge and gaming of the subject, which is completely dishonest. Is our government... Uh, now, luckily, people like Congressman uh, Burchett and others have said, look, if, if these civilizations were hostile, we'd be a, a charcoal floating through space. I mean, it, it clearly, if you're tens of thousands to a million years more advanced technologically than we are, if they were outright hostile to us, it would just be over. Uh, I think, however, things get misconstrued. Let's take, for example, all the nuclear silo cases. Well, it turns out these ET craft, the real ones, are concerned about those systems because if they were launched in a war, it would destroy life on Earth, and they view life on Earth as a very special place. Secondly, when you detonate a thermonuclear weapon, it puts out not only a, a electromagnetic pulse everybody knows about, it puts out what Tesla described as a scalar signal. And the scalar is faster than the speed of conventional light or electromagnetic propagation because it's a point that goes out in a line as opposed to a wave like normal light that we're seeing. So those disrupt extraterrestrial communications and travel. So the reason you saw those craft that uh, crashed near Roswell was because that was the only atomic bomb squadron in the world in 1947, 509th Army Air Vince, uh, Walker Field. Dr. Greer challenges the narrative. Is our uh, Walker Field. Dr. Greer challenges the narrative of hostility traditionally associated with extraterrestrial life. If advanced civilizations wanted harm, wouldn't they have acted by now? This perspective invites us to reconsider the narrative of fear and to think critically about the motives behind it. How might acknowledging our place in a broader, peaceful cosmic community change the way we see ourselves and our planet? If extraterrestrial beings are concerned with our nuclear capabilities to the extent of intervening, what does this imply about their intentions towards human life and Earth? I would not share things except I can back it up, which is why I gave the House Oversight Committee, the Senate Intelligence Committee, the Pentagon, the White House, a hard drive with terabytes of this data on it, including the witness testimonies, where all the facilities are, images of what the ET craft look like we down, what the bodies look like from the description of first-hand military witnesses who handled them with a forensic artist drawing it. We provided all this, so I think at this point, anyone who would have a cursory glance through that data would go, my God. Now, yes, I will say, you know, I was warned in 1991 by an intelligence officer. He said, if you tell the people the truth about this, you will lose all credibility because the truth is much less believable than the fiction we're selling. That is a real catch-22. You know, do you tell the truth and lose credibility, or do you tell some kindergarten version of the truth to placate people? I am not doing the latter. But it's controversial. I will admit it's extremely controversial. But, I mean, at my stage of life, I mean, I have 12 grandchildren. I'm 68 years old. I'm not someone who feels like I need to 
pitter-patter around the, the tulip garden, right? What our goal is, is that enough is put in place in the next 6 to 12 months that the actual ET bodies, craft, and man-made assets are first acquired and shown to the members of Congress and White House and then to the world's public. I think it's achievable in the next year or so if, if we aren't diverted. With evidence handed over to the highest levels of government, Dr. Greer stands at the forefront of one of the most pivotal disclosures in human history. But the path to truth is fraught with disbelief and controversy. How do we navigate the fine line between skepticism and the undeniable evidence presented before us? In a world teetering on the brink of major disclosure, how should we prepare ourselves for the potential revelation of extraterrestrial life and technology? If you liked this video and you would like to see more amazing content, go ahead and check out the next video on our channel.